Okay, so picking up where we did last time, uh, we were talking about uh, some a bunch of preliminaries that we have to uh, recognize before we can kind of put pieces together and actually write down a theorem. Um, it's going to uh, be a certain amount of setup. Apologies for the the yeah the effort that has to be put into that. So reminder, we talked about boundary and in particular going forward, boundary is now an oriented thing. Um, this is a a shift from previously where we thought of boundary just as being kind of the 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 edge or the border or something like that. Uh, so uh, now the word boundary means oriented. Uh, I forgot to mention, as I uh, have a bad habit of doing, uh, that this symbol here, the partial symbol, um, I know it seems a little weird, but the partial symbol is pretty standard notation to represent boundary. So uh, partial D means the boundary of D. Okay. And we talked about what that convention is last time. Uh, uh, what a lot of people like to abbreviate as counterclockwise, but again, keep in mind that's just the abbreviated version. You always have to think it through. Um, okay, so now, next thing. We're going to talk about accumulation. This is not a new topic. right? We've talked about accumulating quantities a lot. Uh, so in particular, uh, we've described how mass accumulates over areas, or it can, depending on the certain, can be thought of as accumulating over areas. So in particular, if I have this whole region here, I'm going to color green, and I can talk about how much mass is in that region. Okay, well, I can take that region and cut it in half, or cut it into two pieces, let's say, and I can talk about uh, the amount of mass in the left blue Part, and I can talk about the amount of mass in the right purple part, and the whole is the sum of the parts. I mean, that's the nature of mass, right? If you just kind of, if you if you have a cake and if you cut it in half, you have the same amount of cake, right? Okay. All right. So uh, various things accumulate. I do like to point out not everything accumulates. Now, this is a class on calculus. We're going to do a bunch of stuff with integrals. Integrals are all about accumulating quantities. That's what Riemann sums are. It's just adding up accumulating quantities. Um, so we are going to see lots of accumulating quantities, but again, not everything is. So in particular, perimeter does not accumulate over areas. Now, again, I, I, I emphasize we're talking about accumulation over areas. So we're talking about having an area that I might, for example, want to talk about the perimeter of. right? And then I'm going to take that area. I'm going to uh, divide the area like so, let's say, uh, so that we have, again, sort of a blue left side and a purple right side. And now I'm going to ask, is the perimeter of the green equal to the perimeter of the blue plus the perimeter of the purple? And no, of course not. Right? It just isn't. There's extra perimeter. I created perimeter when I sliced with this red slice right here. Right? This red slice is part of the perimeter of the blue side. It's part of the perimeter of the purple side. It is not part of the perimeter of the whole. Right? So uh, perimeter just does not accumulate over areas. Does that make sense? Everybody happy? So let's not take it for granted, right? If something is an accumulating quantity, hey, cool. Not obvious, not to be assumed. Okay. All right, so there is a particular special accumulating quantity that I want to talk about. It's very counterintuitive, but uh, boundary circulation. Believe it or not, given a vector field, we're going to assume there's some uh, given vector field that's uh, you know, uh, uh, just uh, 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 constant for the, for the purposes of the question. Uh, but uh, boundary circulation is an accumulating quantity, and it doesn't feel like it should be. Because after all, when you take your region and you cut it, right? when you cut your region, you're cutting and creating new boundary on which your boundary circulation calculations will have values, right? So it kind of feels like we're creating more boundary circulation when we make this cut, just like we were literally making more perimeter. But here's the, here's the thing, and it's just wonderful how this works out. Um, thinking about the left side 
uh, let's see here. I'll, I'll try to be consistent with my color choices. The boundary of the left, so left side, we're going to be looking at a line integral over that part of the boundary plus line integral of this part of the boundary. So what I have in blue here represents the two curves over which I'll need to compute line integral to get the circulation of the left side. And then looking at the right side, oh, I guess I will just use green here. Looking at the right side, uh, again, following the convention about orientation, counterclockwise and all that, there are the two pieces of line integral that I have to compute for the right side. And I want to compare that to the hole. So let's look at the boundary circulation around uh, the, the whole original thing. All right, so let's uh, compare. Is purple equal to green plus blue? And again, very casual glance. It doesn't look good because, again, there's this red thing here. There's, it's, uh, you know, it's part of the blue circulation. It's part of the green circulation. It's not at all part of the purple circulation. really seems like we've got a problem. But the beautiful fact is, and you notice pretty quickly, uh, let's see here, let me, let me erase all of that. Let's look just at these pieces right here. Right? These two pieces, uh, you know, the blue orientation on this red uh, edge, the green orientation on this red edge, same edge. Opposite orientations, they cancel. Right. So in fact, even though, yes, technically I kind of created some new stuff, they just cancel. Does that make sense to everybody? And now going back to what the picture was before, uh, this being the picture, and keeping in mind that all this stuff in the middle cancels. All that stuff in the middle goes away. Now, uh, with that cancellation of curve, is blue plus green equal to purple? Why, yes, it is. It totally is. So surprising how this works out. And I think it's worth pointing out that... Um, uh, part of the reason that we didn't think this was going to work out is because we just got through making a similar argument about perimeters. Perimeters are, again, about uh, kind of the edges, uh, you know, the boundary, blah, blah, but without any sort of, an, uh, of orientation noted, right? This orientation on boundaries that we talked about last time, and we quickly reminded of this time, this business about orientation is what makes uh, these the, you know the the two different orientations that I get on this uh, this cut edge here. The business about orientations and counterclockwise and all that business is why these two were oriented in opposite directions. That's why the cancellation happened. That's why this was able to work out. Right. So um, very important. This business about viewing the boundaries as being oriented and oriented according to sp specific arbitrary to be fair, but specific and standard convention. Okay. All right. Okay, now uh, weakness of what I've got here is that I've only cut um, a, a region into two pieces. Uh, a complaint, reasonable complaint might be, yeah, but I'm going to be cutting it up into uh, a couple hundred pieces or thousands of pieces or in the limit as the number of pieces goes to infinity, right? I mean, if you, the more you slice, it seems like there's more potential for this to not work. But let me point out, it's all the same. Uh, and so in particular, let's look at a scenario like this where I've got a bunch of pieces, right, that I'm going to slice up my solid. I've got my solid uh, area over here. We're thinking about the boundary curve. Boundaries oriented the way boundaries are oriented, of course, right? And I want to talk about the uh, is the whole the sum of the parts. Do we have accumulation uh, here again? Talking about boundary circulation. Well, there's a bunch of new edges that have been created. So, for example, by this slicing process, I've created this new edge right here. How do I know that that's going to cancel? Well, I know it's going to cancel because thought of as part of the boundary of the region to the left, it's going to be oriented that way. Thought of as part of the boundary of the region to the right, it is oriented that way. These are opposite orientations on the same curve. It cancels. 
Um, ditto with, oh, let's say this piece right here. That piece oriented that way on that side, oriented that way on that side. Again, opposite, again, cancel. You can see this is just always going to work. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. All right. So the only pieces that aren't going to cancel are these pieces that are part of the actual original boundary of the hole. And they don't cancel because, like, you look at uh, this edge right here. Why is there no cancellation on this edge? Well, because there is nothing on the other side of it for this little piece of this little piece of area, you know, this little piece of the boundary of this little piece of area. There's nothing for that to cancel with because there's nothing over here because it's part of the original boundary. And so it's just kind of perfect. All the interior cuts, you know, as I cut up the cake, all those interior cuts just kind of disappear and we're left with just the boundary of the hole. So boundary circulation is an accumulating quantity. Weird fact. All right, let's see here. That's uh, that's good. Okay. So now here's a, another way to think of this. Um, I'm gonna. It's gonna take me a while to get to. Oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead. So I had a question about the previous diagram. Yep. Like um, when you zoom into like mm -hmm. the yeah the page. So like I'm talking about the arrow that goes up and down. Mm -hmm. Isn't like one of them like longer than the other? Oh, no, uh, very importantly, they're the same. So let, 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 let's look at this edge right here, right? So the purpose of this arrow right here is just to represent what direction am I oriented as I go up that red piece of curve, right? Um, and the purpose of this blue arrow here is to indicate which direction am I, am I going, again, along the exact same piece of curve, Right? So the green and blue here are only serving to describe directions. They're both happening on the exact same curve. Okay. Is that, is that satisfying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yeah, the next thing I'm going to show you is going to seem a little bit weird uh, a little bit later, probably not today, uh, probably on Friday. I'm going to be able to make an analogy that I hope will make this go down a little bit easier, a little bit easier to swallow. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm going to point out that even though boundary circulation is something that you, uh, that you visualize on the boundary, after all, that's where it's computed. It's computed on the boundary. You tend to think of it as being on the boundary. But I claim that that's a red herring. That's a misdirection. That's uh, not the right way to think about it. Uh, point being, this is an accumulating quantity. This accumulates over areas. And accumulating over areas means that I've got to think about the whole area. <coughs> Forget about the boundary. The whole area, uh, the area over the left side, and the area kind of of the right side. Those are pieces of areas. Uh, there's lots of accumulating quantities that I can associate to the green, the blue, and the red. Mass, I can associate to these pieces of area. Uh, the amount of work that it takes to accomplish a task on these, I can think of as being uh, something that's associated to these pieces of area. Boundary circulation should still be thought of as something that you associate to the pieces of area because well, I'm claiming that accumulates over the areas. The fact that it happens to be computed on the boundary is a distraction. And don't get suckered in uh, to, uh, to that way of thinking. So uh, now, so in particular, uh, <clears throat> uh, if I were to think about this the way I'm proposing, and if I were to say, let's uh, think about the total boundary circulation for this whole thing. Yeah, it's computed on the boundary curve. Again, distraction. Don't think about that. Right? But if I think of the, the, um, the boundary circulation for the whole, and if I compare that against the boundary circulation over just uh, one of these little pieces, it would be reasonable for me to say, well, look, the, the accumulating quantity in question, the how much I compute for this little region is telling me how much of the green quantity is happening inside of this orange piece. 
if I were to make this statement about mass, this would be uncontroversial. You know, how much of the green mass is inside of the orange region? Well, just compute the mass in the orange region. That's how much of the green mass is in the orange region. <laughs> it's just very straightforward. Yes? But if we're just trying to calculate the boundary on the outside, then why, how, yeah. wouldn't it just be the edge most inside that calculates it? Like that middle square is actually not included anywhere on the outside. Again, so, so you're following the distraction. Right? Oh. And yeah, yeah. No, no, you're right that you know the way we actually execute the calculation happens on the boundary. But again, I, I'm, I'm going to suggest we should choose not to think of it that way. You could think of it that way, but let's choose not to. Let's choose to think of it as a calculation, the details of which are, are not really what we're interested in, but it's a calculation that happens for an area. Okay. Is that satisfying? No, okay. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've got a certain amount of green mass. We've got a certain amount of mass in the orange. And if I ask how much of the green mass is in the orange region, well, we'll just look at the mass in the orange region. Where it starts to seem weird is, again, if you, start, <laughs> if you think about that in terms of the boundaries, then it's, we're going to find ourselves saying seemingly preposterous things like how much of this circulation is happening within this circulation. <coughs> And that seems outrageous and uh, non sequitur uh, disconnect. So, like the last right. sentence, or the, the width pieces having locations on the interior, yeah. it's just almost hard to like to theorize that, but it does exist. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. We, I would say, we can choose to think of it that way. Okay. Right. Okay. And it, and it's very helpful to think of it that way. And uh, roughly speaking, if you know, in any situation where you're dealing with something that behaves in a certain way that behaves like a certain thing, if it really does behave like that thing, then you can pretend that it is that thing and nothing bad was going to happen because uh, by assumption it behaves that way. Okay. Yeah, All right. So very weird, but um, we can think of um, boundary circulation as having location in the interior. And if you want to know how much, well, how much of the green boundary circulation is inside uh, of the orange region, well, then, yeah, this compute that boundary circulation. That's how much of the green is inside of the orange. Very weird. Okay, the re uh, so, uh, and so this sentence down here I think is a really good one. Even though we don't think of it this way, typically, I encourage thinking of boundary circulation as being kind of like a stuff. I mean, after all, it's an accumulating quantity, like mass. It has all the earmarks of mass. It behaves just like mass. Pretend that it is mass, even though it's not. Okay. All right. So, with that in mind, uh, let's talk about density. And uh, you all know what density is. And so here's a uh, reminder. <clears throat> Given a, uh, a piece of area, DA... Right, we can talk about how much mass uh, there is in a little piece of area. Right, so in this air, in this green area, there's a certain amount of purple mass, and we have this old idea, this old concept called density. So density, whoops, density says how much of your accumulating quantity is there per unit area in question? Right, so in this case, mass per unit area, and again, old, old idea. Okay. The fact that this is mass is not the point. It totally could have been population. Right? Could have been population per unit area, another totally reasonable notion of density. Big surprise, they call that population density. Right? Again, old, old ideas. So here, I'm just going to make the modest suggestion that, well, okay, but we also have uh, areas over which we can talk about, well, how much boundary circulation is there. And now, again, you're going to be tempted to think about boundary circulation as this thing that kind of happens on the boundary. And again, let's not think of it that way. Let's think of boundary circulation as being a stuff-like substance. After all, it behaves just like a stuff-like substance. And so the amount of that accumulating quantity 
is again something that we can call a density. And because the stuff in question, the accumulating quantity in question is circulation, big surprise, we call this circulation density. Now I know it's getting a little weird, <laughs> right? Uh, we think of circulation as being a sort of an algebraic construction. I'm imposing upon you to think about it as a stuff and then I'm further imposing upon you to think about there being associated how much of that stuff per unit size and uh, this idea of a density and it's not particularly physically relatable absolutely okay but uh, like I say um, it behaves this way so you might as well think of it this way and with this in mind uh, circulation density it turns out is a really really important concept and we're going to do a powerful thing with this in just a moment so we need to have our, uh, our uh, terminology straight on what this is circulation density intuitively quantity per unit size various claims I'm going to make about it here one is if you have a vector field P comma Q then here is the formula that will compute it for you for a given vector field P comma Q this computes circulation density and it goes by many names uh, I like to call this Green's operator because of well you're going to see uh, just uh, on the very next uh, uh, slide you might say uh, we're going to write down Green's theorem and this is the operator that makes Green's theorem work so you can see why I would call it Green's <coughs> operator um, I like to abbreviate it as GRN that's a personal preference you don't have to use that uh, more common notations are rote and curl now let me remind you uh, what this is you know we've talked about circulation before um, and uh, <clears throat> circulation represents the extent to which a fluid is kind of doing like this, right? We talked about a leaf that you drop in the water, that leaf will start rotating, depending on what the fluid is doing. So, uh, rote for rotation, curl for curl, because it, the idea is there's a suggestion that there is some sort of a twistiness of sort. It, it's just terminology. This is just a word that's intended to conjure an image, which I've think very fairly is not that different from a rotation. Just It's just terminology. Um, so you're going to see all of these notations. These are all reasonable notations to represent this formula, which represents this quantity, which intuitively is this construction. All right, so a lot to digest there. Now I am going to complain about one of these uh, notations. I, I don't much care for this one here. Um, uh, this one here I think is uh, unfortunate. Um, the, the reason I don't like it is uh, a lot of things about how this is written make it look like our vector field is three-dimensional. Check it out, there's a cross product right there. Cross product is a peculiarity of R3. We have a two-dimensional vector field. So what, what's going on with this cross product? There is no cross product, it doesn't make any sense. Again, likewise, we are in two dimensions. We have a two-dimensional vector field. There is no K vector in our world that we're actually doing business in. Okay? So this notation is a, a real sketchy in my uh, opinion. Uh, now, th let me tell you where it comes from. Real, I'm going to be quick about this because ultimately the point here is that we don't really care. Okay? Uh, but uh, if you were to pretend that this were a three-dimensional vector field. If you were to think of this as P comma Q comma zero. Now I emphasize that that's making stuff up. That isn't here. That's not what this is. But if you were to pretend and put a zero on the end, and if you were then to compute del cross of that three-dimensional vector field, that's not what we actually have. And if you were to then dot it with the K vector, zero, zero, one, which again, doesn't really exist in the world that we're actually dealing with. But if you were to just crank that out, guess what? You would get this exact formula. And so, you know, there's an appeal there. Um, I just think it's uh, sloppy at best, and I don't see any advantages. I don't see why anyone would prefer this over any of these alternatives. So, um, 
our book will use this at least a couple of times, as I recall. And I, I nah. anyway, I I don't want to say you can't, but I will say uh, I don't like it. You should ask yourself why you like it if you do. And by the way, I'm always open minded. If you if you want to come and make a case for why you think this makes loads of sense, I'm all ears. Please please let me know. I've never uh, I've never really bought it. Okay, so we are actually ready to form a powerful theorem. Here it is. We've got all the pieces. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. For like the last expression above. Yeah. Um, like if we took like a symbolic two by two matrix where the mm-hmm. first row was like partial x partial y and the bottom yeah. was like pq, mm-hmm. and the determinant of that was like kind of these sorts yeah. of things, right? So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there uses of that matrix in general or not real? Oh. Um, you know, not that I've seen. I don't want to say no because um, you know it could be that there's a use that takes a certain point of view where I've always just taken a different point of view and I just haven't needed it. Um, but uh, I'll point out that even if you did decide that you wanted to run with that, it's still not a cross problem. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's a, it is an interesting uh, an interesting point of view. All right. Okay. So here's where we put it all together. We've done all of our groundwork. We can form an awesome theorem now, and it goes like this. We're going to start with circulation. That's circulation around a boundary. So boundary circulation, to be more explicit. Um, again, it's an expression. It's a, it's a formula, and I don't want to think of it that way. I want to think of it as being a quantity. I want to think of it as being just an independent, separate thing, like mass or like work or something like that. Right, so think of circulation as being a quantity. We've already argued that it's an accumulating quantity. The whole is the sum of the parts. Every time we've had an accumulating quantity, we've thought of the whole as being the sum of the parts by writing, for example, m equals double integral of dm. Right? And that's just representing the idea that you can chop up your domain into a bunch of little pieces and add up over all those little pieces. So we get to do this, again, because of the accumulation feature. And then uh, what we have above, actually, let me go back up to it. Here it is. D sigma is density times dA. So let's plug that in here. D sigma, density times dA. Notice I've chosen to represent the density uh, with uh, Green's operator, calling it GRN, uh, Green's operator. You you can call this rote. You can call this curl. Various different options. Uh, But to all that's happening here in orange is I'm writing down explicitly how to think of a little piece of an accumulating quantity as being a density times the size, which again, you can do for all accumulating. So all together, we've made three different little connections here, and our final punchline is kind of a jaw dropper. Uh, it is that a boundary circulation can be computed by way of a special double integral, specifically double integral over the interior or you know, what two-dimensional region your curve was the boundary of. Shocking result. Um, these two integrals aren't even the same kind of integrals. right? We've seen examples in the past where you turn one double integral into a different double integral, like with pullbacks and stuff. right? But here we have not only different kinds of integrals, but different dimensions of integrals. right? Something that's intrinsically a one-dimensional domain relating to another integral that has what is intrinsically a two-dimensional domain. That's really surprising. Okay. All right, so this is what's known as Green's Theorem. Uh, My take, anyway, on on Green's Theorem. Uh, And uh, let's uh, let's use it. So let's crank one out. Let's get our hands dirty. And here we go. So... uh, question is to compute a certain vector line integral. Now, 
before we go on into uh, other details, let me point out that that's not really quite technically what Green's theorem is about. Green's theorem is about line integrals, yes, 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 but on boundaries, specifically on boundaries. It's got to be a boundary. Says so right there in the theorem. Easy to lose track of this, easy to forget. Um, uh, it's a real tragedy. I see this happen sometimes, and students will take a line integral that's not around a boundary, just like a line integral on some curve, and want to relate that to a double integral. It doesn't make any sense. Green's theorem specifically and only addresses line integrals on boundaries. Okay, so before we do anything with this example, we have to ask, is our curve here, and let's see here, here's our curve, clockwise oriented unit circle, <coughs> is that curve a boundary? Now, um, careful, uh, remember the word boundary is a loaded word at this point? Boundary means, I mean, it comes, it, the, there's, a, there's a critical um, associated concept. When you say boundary, there is an orientation involved. And you're stuck with the convention. The convention is, um, you know, again, loosely speaking, counterclockwise. So is this curve a boundary? No, it's a clockwise. Boundary means counterclockwise, so we lose. Everybody with me so far? This is not a boundary. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, good news, uh, this curve, now I'm going to, uh, uh, gosh, let me just indicate the direction uh, sort of like this so I don't get in my own way here. But I'm going to point out that um, this is same curve opposite orientation as the counterclockwise unit circle. Now, forget about the blue one. Let's just talk about the green one for a second. This counterclockwise oriented unit circle, is that a boundary? Why, yes, it is. It is a boundary. Literally, it is the boundary of this yellow region that I'm going to call D. Right, so blue is not a boundary, but orange is, and blue and orange are very closely related. Blue and orange are the same curve, just with opposite orientations. Right? So uh, <clears throat> we were asked about an integral on the blue curve. We're going to relate that to an integral on the orange curve, which is, again, same thing, opposite orientation. And the relationship, when you do the opposite orientation, opposite orientation means you get a minus sign in the value of the integral. How are we doing so far? Everybody happy with that? Yeah. I yeah, actually didn't get why, like, it's not a boundary if it's on the right side. Like, is that just the definition? Or? Yeah, the, the word boundary, let me go back uh, up to uh, here. Uh, 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 boundary implies an orientation. Specifically, we have to follow the convention, and the convention is um, uh, counterclockwise. Okay. Yeah, that's and, and and again, it's uh, arbitrary but standard, and minus signs matter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and and these minus signs again, you know, I, I made this comment before. Uh, it seems like a, just a sign error. Sign errors we're accustomed to thinking of as trivialities, but I emphasize this is not a trivial sign issue, right? This is a sign that is connected to deep and significant ideas that are important for why the theorem works in the first place. I remind you, it was only because we made this convention that that, uh, that boundary circulation accumulated in the first place. This whole thing crashes and burns catastrophically if you take this away, right? So we have to stick with it. Right? This is what allowed us to get the theorem. You can't then take the theorem and then throw this away. Okay. Right, so more than you asked, I know. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. All right. So back to our example. Yeah. So now we're looking at this uh, this orange curve. Well, that orange curve is a boundary. Um, and Green's theorem tells us that if you have a line integral on a boundary then you can write that as a double integral over the interior. And of course, the interior is just that yellow region. Everybody good so far? 
Now, let, let me let me point one thing out about uh, Green's theorem. Uh, Green's theorem. Uh, let me go back to the thing up here in the, the general statement of it. Uh, Green's theorem is um, it's a tool that turns one integral into a different integral. It's not a magic wand, right? It's not a uh, you could just you know uh, wave it and then boom the answer comes out right so we turn an integral that may be hard to compute into another integral that hey who knows could be just as hard to compute possibly worse could be right it's kind of like substitutions in that way right think back to you know when you were calc one right you're doing substitutions and uh, sometimes you think you have the right substitution but you plug it in and it just makes things all the worse. Right? Well, same with Green's theorem. It's a tool, not a wand. So uh, it is not immediately clear that just because we've invoked Green's theorem that that's going to actually give us an answer. It just happens in this case, because I rigged it up this way, of course, um, but it happens in this case that this integral is actually pretty easy to compute because uh, for our vector field, right, we've got this vector field F and it has all kinds of ugly in it which, by the way, is why I didn't want to brute force this in the first place. This integral, if you were to, if you were to do this the old-fashioned way, yikes, right? Not, uh, not a pleasant thing. But if we compute Green's operator here, Green's operator, various partials, it ends up being 2, which is really nice. And needless to say, uh, an integral over a unit disk with a constant bound, pretty easy uh, chapter five argument. Uh, it's going to be two times the area. Don't forget your minus sign, and so minus two pi. Everybody happy? All right. All right. So when? Okay, here we go. Let's do another one. Uh, we got a curve here. Now this curve is made up of four line segments. It's that line segment followed by that, followed by that, followed by that. Uh, kind of a triangular figure eight kind of a deal, if you will. We want to do an integral on this curve. Right? Vector line integral for this vector field, whatever. And again, you could brute force this. The problem with brute forcing this is that there's four separate curves. And so you're going to have four separate parameterizations and four separate pullbacks. And again, not that you can't do it. It's just I wouldn't think we'd want to do that. So let me show you the alternative. Mm, excuse me. Mm. Um, the alternative is to try to take advantage of the fact that this appears to be a boundary, right? You look at this curve and you see the gray on the inside, it kind of looks like, I mean, the purple is the border between gray and white, so, I mean, it feels like a boundary. But again, the word boundary is a loaded word. You have to think about orientations. It's a really big deal. Uh, so let's think through the orientations. And I'm going to start with uh, this part of C, and that is conveniently and pretty clearly the boundary of this region, D1. Is that cool? Okay. All right, now let's look at the other part of C. Uh, here it is. The other part of C is uh, about like this. Right, that's the other part of C. Is that a boundary? Uh, well, oh, man, it's not. It's going, it's clockwise. Right, looking around D2. Keeping in mind the direction that C is going, C is going like this. It's just not counterclockwise. This this light blue curve here is not a boundary. So again, frustrated. So the, now the resolution is pretty straightforward. Let's just look at the exact opposite of C. Same curve, opposite orientations. That dark blue, the orientation opposite of the light blue, is literally the boundary of D2 orientation and everything, right? So what I have in dark blue is a boundary. Uh, and the opposite orientation on that is what gives me the second half of my curve C. So green plus light blue is the curve that I'm actually interested in. 
Uh, green is a boundary, light blue is not, but it's the opposite of a boundary. Is everybody on board? Does that, everybody see what's happening? I'm trying to use the colors to make that as clear as possible. Okay, so cool, no problem. Um, uh, we have to compute the integral on green plus light blue because after all, that's what, uh, um, <clears throat> that's what C is. And light blue is just the same as dark blue but with an opposite orientation. And opposite orientation, again, means that you just put a minus sign uh, out front. Everybody okay? It all kind of falls apart at this point in a, in a good way. <laughs> uh, so, um, you yeah, know, let's look at these two integrals. Uh, let's see here. Uh, I can apply Green's theorem to that one. I can apply Green's theorem to this one. After all, the domain for this is literally a boundary. The domain for this, literally a boundary. Don't forget this minus sign. That minus sign carries through. Uh, and then you got to compute Green's operator. Now, a uh, nice little exercise for you all to think about, but Green's operator, uh-oh, uh, a color problem. Um, compute Green's operator. Uh, this vector field, Green's operator, okay, the uh, x partial of the second coordinate minus the y partial of the first coordinate. Think about the which is the what and the subtraction and the easy to lose the minus sign in there, but uh, that is 9, as it turns out. And now I've changed my hard line integral question into, well, a pretty straightforward. I just need to compute nine times the area of the left triangle, nine times the area of the right triangle, and subtract. And of course, those areas are the same, so the difference is zero, and so zero. That makes sense to everybody? So, stuff going on there, right? This is, there was uh, tricky curves in here. You had to think carefully about orientations and boundaries. And, uh, but to ultimately, with all that uh, straightened out correctly, <coughs> this is just a nice application. Okay. Yeah? So since, like, curl is related to rotation, mm -hmm. would, would that mean that for a curve like this, there would be no net rotation? Uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Exactly. So if you were to, um, oh gosh, it's a little hard to imagine a leaf shaped like that, <laughs> right? Especially since it's kind of, I mean, oh gosh, it, yeah, it's a weird, it's a weird scenario. But yeah, the the uh, the sort of overall, the extent to which the fluid is flowing along this curve C, yeah, grand total, it's flowing backwards just as much as forwards. Yeah. So is that final answer like considered the boundary circulation of F? So uh, uh, <clears throat> close. So keep in mind the question didn't say anything about circulation, right? The question said compute the line integral on this curve C, and one of the first confessions that we had to make was well technically C is not a boundary, right? And so we can't talk about this as being a boundary circulation because the curve isn't a boundary. Uh, but what we can say is that this is a uh, this is a line integral. So the grand total, this line integral that we were actually interested in, um, uh, so vector line integral of this vector field, yeah, is zero. Is, is that satisfying? Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. All right, here's a nice application. Uh, this is a certain amount of trickery in this, uh, but this is just a kind of a clever... Uh, yeah, trick's a pretty good word. Clever trick. So, Green's theorem. Boundary line integral equals uh, double integral of Green's operator. Now, I've applied Green's theorem here to a specially chosen vector field. Now, I'm allowed to apply Green's theorem to whatever vector field I want to, and in this case, I want to apply it to this vector field. You'll see why in a moment. My choice, I'm allowed to make this choice if I want. Right? Green's theorem is true for all vector fields, and it's true for this one. Okay, so why I like this vector field is because if you compute Green's operator of this vector field, it's just one. Easy computation, right? So what? Well, the so what is then I am literally doing integral dA 
which means I'm literally adding up little pieces of area. Grand total, I get the area. So what we've got to, again, a clever choice, right? I very cleverly chose this zero comma x so that green's operator would equal to one so that the double integral would give me area. This is all very carefully planned out. Um, that said, here's our result. A vector line integral computes the area that it traces out. This is pretty weird. And it can be useful sometimes. Now, a notational observation, uh, don't forget we have this idea of coordinate line integrals that are just a notational alternative. Remember, the big idea is that this dx here I can think of as being dx uh, dy like that. And when you write out this dot product, you get uh, 0 dx plus x dy. Right? And so this... This uh, vector line integral that I have on the left that computes area, alternatively, I can think of it as coordinate line integral x dy that computes area. Now, why would I want to do this? And I have two reasons to want to do this. Uh, one is this is the most common way to write this theorem. And the other is uh, I think you got to give do as appropriate if you had to choose between these I and mean, which one of these is more compact I, I, I think I have to confess that the coordinate line integral is a little bit more compact here a little bit easier to write down kind of rolls off the tongue a little more nicely so, uh, <clears throat> so what you will see more commonly is this version of the theorem that boundary line integral x dy computes area okay. all right now Independent fact. Suppose you have a straight line segment from a given starting point to a given ending point. Imagine this is coming out of nowhere. Forget about what we just talked about up there. Straight line segment from x1, y1 to x2, y2. You could straight up plug and chug and compute uh, this line integral right here. Integral over that line segment of x dy. And if you do, if you parametrize this thing, pull back through the parameterization, write it out, do the integral, collect the terms, move things around, a certain amount of algebra. Everybody should do that once in their lives. Won't take you that long. What you find is there's a super convenient, super easy formula for that line integral. It's always x bar delta y. The average of the x coordinates change in the y. Very, very handy. Now, why do we care about this? Well, let's remind ourselves, we already had a theorem about integral x dy. Um, <clears throat> so the overall integral x dy is going to compute area for us. So if I find myself with some region uh, like this uh, where... Um, I've got a bunch of line segments, and I want et cetera, et cetera, all the way around this wacky region here. Right? Um, if I want to write down the entire boundary as I would need to here, let me just go ahead and do the, there we go. Looking around the entire boundary, all I have to do is add up one line segment at a time. Right? So I know that if I go around the whole boundary, I get the area. I know that on each individual piece, I have a super easy formula, just x bar delta y, and you just straight up compute. Uh, it's very convenient. Uh, let me uh, show you how this arithmetic works out. Uh, again, let's just uh, think about this one line segment here. And uh, let's see here, on that line segment, the x-coordinates of the endpoints are 1 and 12, which average to 6 and a half. Uh, delta y, keep in mind now, very importantly, y'all heard me say this a million times, but this is an oriented line segment. It's part of a boundary. Boundary means oriented. It's going that way. So we start here where y is 1. We end here 
where y is 6. And so delta y is positive uh, 5. Not negative, right? It's start to finish. Orientation matters. And so on that yellow piece, uh, let's see here, putting it all together, uh, x bar delta y is uh, a, a trivial arithmetic. Now, I've only done the one edge, but look how easy it was to do that arithmetic. You can do the arithmetic for the remaining eight edges, add them up, boom, area. And uh, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty slick move. Uh, and just to, uh, let's, just to appreciate how nice this is, let's ask how else would I go about computing this area? And I, I pose that that's a pretty nasty problem unless you're pretty, pretty doggone clever. Um, so in particular, think about how you would break this up into separate little triangles like this. Right, there's seven triangles, mostly not right triangles. So you're going to have to like drop perpendiculars and find the equations of the various lines and oh my gosh. And furthermore, these edges, not very nice, they're square roots. So you're going to have nasty arithmetic, whereas with this solution, four-function arithmetic. Pretty slick move. See you all later. Have a good one. Oh, and uh, as usual, uh, make sure I get you marked down as present on attendance.